TikTok, time to rock. Is that is that what we say? I've got David Wood with me, and if you've ever watched anything from him, that's how he starts all of his live streams. So I, I felt like I needed to to steal that from him. Well, he if you don't stuff. know who David is, David, give a give a quick introduction of who you are, and we're gonna get rolling with this topic because you have actually you haven't really talked about this, right? The your academic work on the problem of evil. That's what your specialty is in. Your academic, like all all of your stuff is is on the problem of evil and you never post any videos on the problem of evil. It's, it's, it's a weird situation but uh let the audience know who you are first yeah i'm david wood and uh yeah j- just to just to point out what what cameron just pointed out is that my academic background is in philosophy and my doctoral work uh was on the problem of evil mainly one particular version of the argument from evil but at some point I just decided to focus more on on Islam. But yeah, I did. Uh, just as we were getting ready here, I was thinking, why don't I put together like a big <laughs> series on the problem of evil since that's, that's my that's my background? Yeah. So maybe. May, yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll put something together. Yeah. Well, that's what we're talking about today. And we're going to get into some really interesting things. And you're going to hear some some things about the problem of evil that you probably didn't know existed. Some maybe some responses to it. And then also the main focus of this, obviously, is David Wood. He's going to explain kind of what his dissertation was about, what are his thoughts on the problem of evil more generally. And then the specific version that he looked at in his dissertation was the Bayesian problem of evil, which is a kind of, or with well, the problem of evil, there's not just like one version. That's that's important to know is that there's not just like, you know, evil exists, so therefore God doesn't exist. That's kind of like a basic level version that you you hear sometimes from, from atheists or maybe even like your neighbor or someone mm-hmm. that's close to you. But there are very sophisticated versions of it that avoid a lot of the the objections that you that you see, and we'll, we'll get into all of this. So, how about we start? Well, let, let me let me let you know that if you want to check out David Wood and, and, and more of his stuff, I've got his channel linked in the description of this video. So just right below, do a little drop down, and uh, actually while you're there, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell so you can get notifications when we post videos. All right, let's. Uh, with that, how about I pull up your abstract from your dissertation where you talked about the problem of evil. A specific version of it like I mentioned and I'm just gonna read the whole abstract and then based on that you can just talk about whatever you want what do you think mm-hmm. yep sounds good cool all right cool so here's the abstract from his dissertation and this is when he got his his PhD this is what he wrote on in part 11 of his dialogues concerning natural religion David Hume presented an argument against theism that would now be loosely classified as Bayesian more recently, Paul Draper, he's an ag- agnostic philosopher. I think he's ag- agnostic as opposed to, to atheist. Paul Draper has formalized and expanded upon Hume's reasoning, giving us what some philosophers regard as the most sophisticated version of the problem of evil. Through comparison with the logical and inductive forms of the argument from evil, careful analysis of Hume's dialogues in Draper's writings, and considerable discussion of previous responses to Draper's case, this dissertation examines the philosophical relevance and persuasive power of the Bayesian argument from evil. Due to the argument's use of controversial principles of inference, its treatment of theism as a quasi-scientific hypothesis, its reliance on a Bayesian fallacy, and its susceptibility to refuta- refutation by defenses, theodicies, counterbalancing evidence, and different views of theism, this dissertation concludes that the Bayesian argument from evil fails on multiple levels. It's a big claim. When the flawed elements of Draper's argument are stripped away, we are left with an appeal to a weak form of evidentialism, which is neither novel nor interesting. Super, super interesting. Super, Lots of things to talk about. Why don't we first talk about the different kinds, the different versions of the problem of evil? That might be a good place to start. Yeah, so the the traditional breakdown of the arguments has been into the logical versions of the argument and the inductive, uh, well, in the evidential versions of the argument. So the uh, logical version of the argument from evil actually maintains that there's a contradiction. There's a contradiction in the theist's mind. If you're a theist, you believe that, uh, if, if we're talking about traditional theism, then you believe that an all powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being exists. And yet, you also believe that there's tons of evil and suffering in the world. So you have the, the breakdown with, with evil is, is what's called natural evil. 
So these would be things like earthquakes and tornadoes and coronavirus and things like that. Um, we don't normally think of those things as as evil because we think of evil as having a moral component, but philosophers generally use it as you know bad things. And so that's called natural evil as opposed to moral evil. And then you have moral evil, you know, people going around killing each other, racism, things like that. And so the idea is if you believe in something, if you believe in a being that has all the power that can possibly be had and is as good as possible, then there shouldn't be evil in, in the world. And so the claim of logical versions of the argument from evil is that if you're a theist, you have a, con you're, you have a contradiction in your mind. You have things that just cannot be reconciled. And so historically, that was the main version of the argument from evil. Uh, it's put forward as a contradiction in the thinking of theists. And that's no longer the case. Uh, n almost no one at the philosophical level now, n so philosophers, no one takes that seriously. You still find it online. You still find it. Uh, it might be popular to some extent among like Internet atheists or something like that. But uh, no one takes it seriously anymore. And, and the reason for that is a lot of the work of, of Alvin Plantinga, but um, to for the logical version of the argument to succeed, you'd have to know something like God can't have morally justifiable reasons for allowing suffering or allowing the kinds of suffering that, that we see around us. And you can say, well, as an atheist, you can say, well, I just, I can't think of any, any good reasons or something like that. But the claim that God has reasons for allowing suffering would have to be necessarily false. And there's just no way to show that, right? You can't defend that claim. So, and, and planning as example is called the, the free will defense. But what if, what if God thinks that free will is really important because you can't have certain things without it. You can't have moral freedom. You can't have certain kinds of love and so on without free will. What if God believes that free will is really important because of that? And what if the evil we see around us is the result of free will? So human beings doing evil to one another. But Plantinga says, what if even the natural evil, what if earthquakes and so on are the result of evil beings using their free will? So going around pushing tectonic plates and things like that, we would find that ridiculous, but that's not the point. The point is, is that logically impossible? And no philosopher is going to say that's logically impossible, that there are, you know, powerful beings pushing around tectonic plates. They'll say it's silly. They'll say it's ridiculous, but they're not going to say it's impossible. And so what happened here with the logical version of the argument from evil is 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 basically requires too much in order to show that there's an actual contradiction in the argument you have to maintain that you know claims like god has reasons for allowing suffering are somehow necessarily false and at the uh, again at the popular at the popular level people don't uh, pe lots of people don't understand that if you're saying that something is a logical contradiction you have a pretty high burden of proof that's on you to show that there's a logical contradiction and not just I'm going to call it a logical contradiction because that's how it seems to me, even though I can't defend it. Uh, whereas, you know, philosophers are are aware of the fact that if they say this is a contradiction, then they have to they have to be able to defend that claim. And there's just too much in the logical version that you would have to rule out that you just can't. And so this doesn't keep in mind, this doesn't mean that there's no problem of evil uh, or that there's no successful argument from evil. It just means that whatever the problem is, it's not that there's a contradiction in the atheist's thinking. And this is true, even according to people like William Rowe, who's one of the main defenders of, uh, he's passed on now, but uh, he, in the modern day, he's one of the main defenders of the argument from evil. Um, Paul Draper and others, they point out that the, the traditional argument just fails. It's, a, it's not a good argument. And, and by so, traditional uh, argument, you're still referencing the logical version of it, right? The one that says that there's a sort of contradiction between God's existence and the existence of evil. There's like a yeah, contradiction. And they've tried to... they've. Yeah, they, they've tried to explain or, or tried to give a defense of, of how those two are in, in conflict, but sort of what you're saying is that there's there's a there's a way out, and the way out is that God has a reason for allowing the evil in the world. And uh, there's a there's a, another philosopher, his name is, what is his name? Pike? I've 
got it written down here. Uh, Nelson Pike. Nelson Pike. And he bas- mm-hmm. Yep. And he says that basically he, he gives a parent analogy. It's like, I am able to prevent my child suffering by like giving them medicine. And, and so suppose that the medicine that I give them is just like really disgusting. It tastes really gross. So it's going to like cause them to suffer a little bit. But so I can prevent that that suffering. I can prevent them from taking mm-hmm. this medicine. But nevertheless, I have a good reason to give them the medicine. It's because it's going to be good for them. So just because you can prevent some evil doesn't mean that even if you're a loving being, it doesn't mean that you're going to prevent that evil. You may mm-hmm. allow that evil because you know it's going to bring about some greater good. So mm-hmm. that's that's one, I, I guess, uh, a, po- a popular response by a, another philosopher who's arguing yeah, let, something let me, along the same lines. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me let me give an argument along those same same lines because I find that lots of again lots of atheists at the popular level will want to resist any response. And here the one. So, so let me give let me give an example along those same lines because it's something that actually happened. And uh, I was thinking about this one day, but um, uh, one of my one of my sons when he was. I think he was about, I think he was about to turn one. So he's around one year old and the doctor said he needed four shots. And so the doctor told me to hold him down while he gave him four shots. And I remember my son looking at me like, it was like he he's looking at me and it's like, he's looking at me thinking, you're my dad, right? Why are you holding me down as this guy stabs me repeatedly in my leg? And so I was thinking about that in the context of the argument from evil. If he were able to formulate an argument without knowing that there's a reason that I'm holding him down and he's getting stabbed in the leg, if he were able to formulate an argument, it would be something like, you know, if my dad really loved me, then Hmm. he wouldn't be helping this guy stab me in the leg. But he is helping this guy stab me in the leg. Therefore, my dad doesn't love me. Uh, so it, it, he'd be able to put together uh, an argument for why I don't love him, even though it's just because at a, as a one year old, he cannot comprehend the reasons that we have for doing things and that there's a there's a greater good involved. The atheist reply to that is. But if you're talking about an all powerful being, an all powerful being is not in that situation. Right. An all powerful being is not in the same situation of, well, the only way for my son to be, you know, protected right now is to get these shots. An all-powerful being can just say, oh, problem solved, snap of the fingers, right? Doesn't have to go through uh, these means to an end. But um, if you're thinking on a if you're thinking on a bigger scale, like are there certain things that God can only get by allowing free will, or are there certain things? Uh, are there reasons for God to allow suffering? Uh, something like a a soul building theodicy where God allows suffering because it helps us develop virtues and things like that. Uh, are there things like that where in order to achieve these results, you would ha- would have to allow suffering? And so here again, an atheist could say, well, I just don't believe that or that sounds silly. That is not the issue for this particular argument. For this particular argument, the only claim is, can you say it's necessarily false that God has reasons for allowing the suffering we see around us? And again, pretty much no philosopher on the planet right now is willing to say, yes, it's necessarily that that statement is necessarily false. And so, again, this doesn't mean there's no problem of evil. It just means you're not dealing with a logical contradiction here. You're dealing with something else. And so what you're dealing with is is an evidential kind of argument. You're saying that God probably doesn't exist or that evil counts as some evidence against God's existence, even though. Uh, it's possible that God exists and evil exists. It's it's uh, it's not a contradiction, but nevertheless, evil is some kind of evidence against the existence of God, and so that's what goes into uh, evidential versions of the argument. Yeah. So why don't we go ahead and turn to to those? Just go ahead and and lay a, a popular one out. Is that is that a lot different from like the Bayesian formulation of of the argument from evil, or well, is the, it or is it along the same lines? Yeah. yeah so. Um, the the breakdown in recent decades has been between uh, logical argument versus evidential arguments. But you can break down evidential arguments into a couple different forms. And so something like William Rowe's version um, is an evidential argument, whereas the, the Bayesian argument is a kind of evidential argument. But you could break them down in, in terms of you could call Rowe's argument a kind of inductive argument, and then you'd have a Bayesian argument. And those would both be kinds of evidential arguments and, and evidential in the sense that they're, they're claiming that this is that this is evidence against uh, the position of theists. Um, let, let me just give because I mentioned that William William Rowe and Paul Draper, um, who are both 
well, again, Roe's dead now, but uh, uh, Roe and Draper uh, were both uh, are both proponents of the argument from evil, and yet they acknowledge that the earlier version of the argument, the logical argument, fails. Let me just give two quotations so people don't think that you know just we're we're, we're Christians and therefore we're, we're rejecting the argument. So William Roe said, "Some philosophers have contended that the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with the existence." of the theistic God, no one, I think, has succeeded in, ex in establishing such an extravagant claim. So this is a an agnostic um, philosopher saying no one succeeded in, in defending this argument. Paul Draper says, the problem is not that some proposition about pain and pleasure can be shown to be both true and logically inconsistent with theism, rather the problem is evidential. So that's, um, that's why these guys are going in an evidential uh, in an evidential uh, route. So if we want to give an inductive, this will be a famous one from, um, pulled up William Rowe's version of the argument here. So William Rowe is kind of the one who came out and championed and popularized uh, an evidential version of the argument from evil. So I'll read through this, and if any of this sounds confusing, no problem, we'll break it down. But he says the premise one, the world contains instances of human and animal suffering that could be prevented by an omnipotent, omniscient being. So the claim here is just in our world, there are instances of human and animal suffering that an omniscient, omnipotent being could prevent. And I don't think any theist is going to uh, reject that claim. In other words, you know, someone dies, could an omnipotent being stop that? Yes. Uh, if you stub your toe, can, could an omnipotent, omniscient being prevent that? Yes, of course, obviously. So no much, not much disputing that. Premise two, some of these instances of suffering do not appear necessary for obtaining some greater good or for preventing some greater evil. Some of these, let me read that again, some of these instances of suffering, so people dying, people in pain, people getting sick, some of these instances of suffering do not appear necessary for obtaining some greater good or for preventing some greater evil. Now notice, he doesn't say that they're not necessary because in order to defend that, he'd have to show, again, he'd, ha he'd have to, it looks like he would be defending some sort of logical version of the argument. He's just saying they don't seem that way. It doesn't seem like these uh, instances of suffering are necessary. So when you see some child get some horrible disease, uh, and die from it, it doesn't seem like, oh yeah, but there's peace in the Middle East now because of that child's suffering. It just seems like there's suffering. It doesn't seem like there's some, some sort of point to it. Premise three, a holy good being, that means, so holy, not in the sense of, you know, holy, 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 but holy, like in completely, a completely good being would, as far as possible, prevent instances of suffering unless they were necessary for obtaining some greater good or for preventing some greater evil. And the conclusion is, therefore, no holy good, omnipotent, omniscient being exists. So if you put all of this together, um, he goes in a, this is an evidential kind of argument because he doesn't say there's definitely no reason for God to allow suffering. It's, there's apparently no good reason for God to allow all of the suffering around us. And so if, if God's, um, if God being completely good means that he would want to do away with these pointless instances of suffering, and if he's omnipotent and omniscient, he would be able to, and we grant that he's able to, then he wouldn't allow suffering. He wouldn't allow what we see around us unless he had some, some greater good that he was focusing on, and yet we can't even think of any greater good here. Uh, any any higher reason that God would need to allow this sort of thing. And so Rose, Rose's conclusion is not just, oh, therefore God definitely does not exist. It doesn't, really doesn't seem like God exists. Is it possible that God exists? Of course it's possible that God exists, but it's kind of, it, it's kind of odd to think that God exists when we can't think of any good reasons for God to allow the suffering that that we see around us, and so it's it's a it's a probabilistic or evidential argument rather than than a, a logical argument. Yeah. So a couple of things to note here. So first of all, this argument is a lot different from the first one in that it's a lot more modest. So mm -hmm. the conclusion is not like you said. It's not that God definitely doesn't exist. 
It's that, yes, yeah, kind of seems like God doesn't exist. And when you have a more modest claim like that, it's going to make it a little bit more plausible, a little bit easier to uh, accept. Depends on mm-hmm. you know how you how you go about defending it and, and whatnot. But modesty, this type of modesty, is usually a good thing in mm-hmm. philosophy. When you can make less extravagant claims, then it's going to uh, appear a little bit more plausible to to people. Mm-hmm. So that's that's actually a, a good thing about his argument is that it's a little bit more modest. Now, how mm-hmm. would you go about uh, responding? to this version of the problem of evil. Yeah, and that's what's uh, that's what's interesting is that now there are there are philosophers who even reject that argument. And there are there are multiple there are multiple reasons, there are multiple ways you could go after this uh, this version of the argument. You could um, you know you could you could point out inconsistencies and unproven assumptions and ambiguous terms and so on. Uh, but notice you could grant everything in the argument. You could grant everything he just said right there and conclude that, OK, there's a, this is a certain amount of evidence against the existence of God. But I can outweigh the evidence you've presented by giving arguments for theism. If you if the logical argument from evil were successful, then arguments for theism would be irrelevant. You would, It would be, you know, like I have all these arguments for a square circle. Well, I don't, I don't care what arguments you have for a square circle. There's no square circle. It's a contradiction. Um, so if the if the logical version of the argument were successful, then then other evidence is irrelevant. If you have a, a probabilistic argument, and you're saying this makes the existence of God improbable as far as this evidence is concerned. You could, in theory, show, well, yeah, but I have evidence that outweighs that. So I, mm-hmm. I have I have greater evidence there. Um, and of course, you can you could do sort of the same thing. You could offer reasons for God to allow the suffering. So as far as some of these instances of suffering do not appear necessary for obtaining some greater good, lots of, lots of times we're thinking of like very specific things, like this person dies and what is the good that arises out of that as, a per, as opposed to more global um, goods, like God just allows you know suffering because there are reasons for God to just allow suffering in general. Um, but the the main the main reason even this argument has fallen out of favor is the rise of what's called skeptical theism, skeptical theism here. And so skeptical theism is the claim that, in effect, if God had reasons for allowing suffering, you would have no reason to think that you would be aware of those instances of suffering. So basically premise two of Rose are you aware of those reasons? Yeah. Yeah. So once you get your mind around this, you start to see a problem with the argument. And by the way, this problem is what leads to the Bayesian argument. The Bayesian argument from evil is meant to avoid this problem. And so uh, here again, at the popular level of, of atheism, atheists will not want to grant skeptical theism. Whereas if you're, you know, if you're taking this seriously and you're trying to come up with a really good argument, you have to take this seriously. So uh, let me read this premise again. And we'll, we'll, we'll break down the problem because it, it might, it's a little tricky to, to get your mind around what the problem here is. Um, okay. So some of these instances of suffering do not appear necessary for obtaining some greater good or for preventing some greater evil. Meaning when I see a tornado wreak havoc in a trailer park, I think, well, what's the greater good there? I don't see any greater good, right? So it doesn't seem like it's necessary for something. Now, the question here is whether that means, whether me not being able to think of any good reason for God to allow that means that God probably has no good reason to allow that. So that that's the real connection. You're, you're, you're reasoning from there don't, there don't appear to be any good reasons for it to, well, therefore, there probably are no good reasons for it, and therefore, God probably doesn't exist. The problem with that is that kind of inference is only as good as the basis you have for thinking that if there were reasons, then you would be aware of them. Now, that's confusing, but we'll, we'll use an example. If, if I say there's probably no adult rhinoceros in this room right now, there's probably no adult rhinoceros in this room right now. And you say, David, how can you make that claim? How can you say there's no adult rhinoceros in this room? Well, that is a, a, a good conclusion. If I say there's probably no adult rhinoceros in this room, 
and you say, why? I say, well, because if there were a fully grown rhinoceros in this room, I would be aware of it. Well, why would you be aware of it? Well, a rhinoceros is a really big creature. And if there were one in this room, I have really good reason to suspect that I would be aware of it and I would see it. But I don't see it. And therefore, I conclude it, it's, it's just silly to think one is you know, hiding, under, hiding under something. So that is a good inference there. But suppose I used a, a different, a different um, bit of reasoning here. Suppose I said there's no insect in this room. And you said, well, David, what's your basis for saying there's no insect in the room? I said, well, I'm looking around and I don't see an insect. Therefore, there, is, there isn't one. Well, that, that's no longer a good argument. That's no longer a, a good inference there. The reason is many insects are very small. In fact, that's pro it's probably, there probably is some sort of insect, a gnat or something somewhere in this room. So me not being able to see an insect is not good evidence that there isn't one in this room. Me not seeing a rhinoceros would be good evidence that there's not a rhinoceros in this room, because if there were a rhinoceros, I would expect to see it. If there were a small insect, I wouldn't expect to see it. It's always possible that it would fly in front of my face. But apart from that, I just wouldn't be I wouldn't be aware of it. So how does it how does this relate to the um, the inductive argument from evil? Well, Roe is saying, well, since I'm not aware of any reasons for God allowing these instances of suffering, therefore, there probably isn't one. The, is that here's the question for philosophers: Is that more like is that more like the claim that there's no rhinoceros in this room? Meaning that if there were reasons, then I I would be I would expect to be aware of them. Like if there were a rhinoceros in this room, I would expect to be aware of it. Or is it more like, well, I don't see an insect and therefore there probably isn't one. And philosophers have generally concluded that it's more like the latter in the sense that if, if God knows everything, if God is omniscient, if you think of like this as all knowledge that can be known, how much of that would we be aware of? Well, a tiny little dot, the amount of human knowledge that humans possess when compared with omniscience would be a tiny, tiny, tiny little speck. And so what business do you have as a human being to say, if God had reasons for allowing evil, then we would be aware of them. That's actually an unstated assumption in Rowe's argument. When he gives premise two, and he says some of these instances of suffering do not appear necessary. And then he concludes, therefore, probably God doesn't exist when you put all the premises together. It's, um, there's this unstated assumption. The unstated assumption is I have good reasons to think that if God had reasons for doing things, I would have access to those reasons. I would be informed of those reasons. Now you can always say, well, God would, God would tell us or something like that. But this, this doesn't change the point here because you could always say, what it, could God have reasons for not telling us what the reasons are. Um, you have to defend at some point for this version of the argument to succeed. You have to defend at some point the claim that we would be aware of God's reasons and therefore us not being able to comprehend God's reasons for allowing suffering actually means that there probably are none. And so if you reject that, if you reject that claim, as you should, even if you're, even if you're a devout atheist, even if you are a devout atheist, I think you should say, okay, if God did exist and God had all kinds of reasons that we are not aware of because God is omniscient and we're not, could God have all kinds of reasons for doing things that I'm not aware of? Yes, God would most certainly have all kinds of reasons for doing things that we are not aware of. And therefore, is it a good assumption in an argument to think that if God had reasons, we would be aware of them? No, that's a completely false assumption. That's a ridiculous assumption to think that we would have access to God's reasons for doing things. Again, he could tell us, but what if what if he doesn't? Do we think that therefore they don't exist? No, you just can't you can't you can't defend that. And so here again, the point is not the point is not that there's no problem of evil or that there's no argument from evil. The point here is that this particular version of the argument has a weakness and has something in it that can't really be defended. So as with the logical version of the argument, if you really wanted to defend it, there are some things in there that you have to defend that philosophers just don't can't defend really well. And if 
uh, if you have this other version of the argument, this inductive form of the argument, well, you have some you have some assumptions in here that you can't actually defend. And even if you say you believe it, even if an atheist says, well, I personally believe that if God had reasons for allowing evil, I would have access to them. I think I'm really, really smart and I would know the same things that God that God knows. You, the, the theist is under no obligation to agree with your argument at that point because he, he rejects an, basically an unstated premise. You, you've got to, here are the premises of my argument. No, you have one that you didn't put on there that's required for your argument, namely that if God had reasons, you would be aware of them. And so you can conclude, if that were true, then you can conclude, well, since I'm not aware of them, therefore there probably are none. But until then, you just can't. And so this isn't, the point here isn't that therefore there's no problem of evil. It's the question is, how do you formulate the argument from evil in a way that avoids this unproven assumption? And uh, so that's what that's what Draper set out to do. And ma matter of fact, let me uh, I just want to give a quote from Rowe here, William Rowe. So this is William Rowe in 1996. So in the 70s um, and 80s, William Rowe was defending this uh, evidential argument from evil. He's arguing that that God probably doesn't exist because. I can't really think of any reasons for God to allow all this suffering, therefore there probably are none. And then so throughout a lot of the 80s and the 90s, you had people promoting skeptical theism, namely, if God exists, then God is going to know all kinds of things that we don't know, and therefore we have to be kind of skeptical about our own ability to understand God's reasons for doing things. And so Roe eventually agreed with the theists. And with not, not just with theists, with other non-theists who are pointing out, yes, this argument has a problem. So Rowe said, 1996, um, after explaining his argument, um, so he, he he talks about his, his earlier argument, which is probably the most popular version of the argument in anthologies on the problem of evil and so on. He says of this argument, I now think this argument is at best a weak argument. To shore it up, we would need some reason to think it likely that the goods we know of are representative of the goods there are. So what he what he means there is when you're saying I can't think of any any reasons for God to allow suffering, you're, you're saying here are all the goods that I'm aware of, and I don't see how any of them are coming out of that that horrible suffering. But Rose's point is I would have to I would have to, for my argument to work, for my older argument to work, I would have to conclude that the goods I'm aware of somehow reflect all goods there are. And I said, I have no basis for thinking that God is not aware of all kinds of other goods that I have no access to or that I'm not aware of. So the point here is, uh, here again, if you line up a bunch of internet atheists and you run through the logical version of the argument from evil, they say, yep, good argument, great argument. Whereas you go up to the, you know, the level of philosophers and the philosophers say, no, terrible argument. And you go to the evidential version of the argument and you present, you line up a hundred internet atheists and show them that argument. They'll say, yep, good argument, slam dunk, slam dunk case against theism. And you go up to the level of philosophers and even the people who defended the argument and were the ones who came out with the argument are saying, yes, yeah, argument's got some problems. We need a, we need a different kind of argument. All right. Uh, let me, let me come in here and uh, talk about a couple things. So you mentioned skeptical theism and by the way, we're going to do some Q and a in just a little bit. So probably another 10, 15 minutes, David and I will continue talking. We'll talk about the, uh, the last version of the problem of evil, the, the last attempt to sort of make a good argument against God's existence from the existence of suffering and evil. So we're going to look at that in just a second, but then we're going to do some Q&A. So if you are sending, I, I, a few people have already sent in super chats, so we are going to back up and, and get to those when we when we do some Q&A. So if you'd like to send in a, a question for David on this topic, make sure that it's, it's relevant to uh, the problem of evil. And uh, if you want to send that in as a super chat, thank you, first of all, and then I can uh, promise you that we'll get to it. Okay, so that that out of the way, you mentioned that uh, basically that one of the, one of the ways that you motivated skeptical theism was you said that our knowledge is very tiny in comparison mm -hmm. to God's knowledge. So that was so that was one thing, and and that I think goes back to kind of Michael Bergman and what he said about our knowledge of the goods there are is not, or we don't know that that. What, what we're familiar with is representative of all the goods that there are. But I think there's another way that we could motivate skeptical theism, and that's by uh, way of complexity. So imagine the good, if there were a good that justified or made it, yeah, or, or it made it morally permissible 
to allow the Holocaust. Think about what mm-hmm. would have to, uh, what, what kind of good would have to be in place in order to justify that. Now, there were, what, 6 million Jews that died. There were a, a, there's a lot of things going on here that for one person, one mind, it seems very unlikely that we would be able to wrap our minds around what type of good would be involved here. And so mm-hmm. one reason to motivate skeptical theism is that some of these goods may just be so complex that we could never even hope to understand what the good is in the first place. So complexity is a, is a potential motivating factor for skeptical theism. Another thing to point out is that humility, like this, this is a stance of humility, skeptical theism. It's like, it's admitting the fact that we don't know everything. There's a whole lot more that God knows than, uh, than we know. And so in, in atheists and agnostic skeptics are usually like, they like humility. They like to, to say, I don't know. And if you're watching this and you're a skeptic, you probably like to say that when it comes to like, you know, what caused the universe? Why does the universe exist? You might be uh, be fond of saying, I don't know, and be okay with that. So why can't theists in a similar way say, I don't know? Let me just give an example to illustrate uh, something you were saying there, because I remember uh, way back in college, um, I, was a, I was a double major in biology and philosophy. So dealing with philosophical arguments in, in philosophy classes, and then I'm going in biology classes. And uh, I remember being in one of my biology classes, and they were giving examples of human beings introducing species into areas where they don't have, you know, it, it's not there. It doesn't exist in the area. So people bring rabbits down to Australia because, hey, it'd be cool if we could hunt rabbits down here. Can't hunt rabbits because there are no rabbits. Let me let me bring some down. Um, and in other areas where, oh, there's this harmful creature in the area, it has no predator, let me bring in a predator for that creature and so on. And over and over and over again, it ends in complete disaster, right? <laughs> like you, you destroy your ecosystem. Oh, let's bring frogs down here to do this. And oh, now the frogs are destroying the ecosystem. Let me bring down some snakes that eat these frogs. Up oh, now, these now the the snakes have destroyed the ecosystem. And the reason is we kind of have this super simplistic thinking of oh, here's this problem. Here's what we need to fix that. Instead of you are not grasping how all of these things in this ecosystem are connected. You're not, you're not even, you, you, your mind cannot even grasp all the connections here. And so you're thinking, well, why not just do this? And then you think, oh, well, I'm just going to do that to fix all of this. And it ends in complete disaster because you don't understand how, how all of these things are connected. And, and like here that. I'm not, I, I'm not even, I'm not even defending the claim that God allows this because he is aware of all these intricate connections. I'm saying if you have, a drop of skepticism in you. It should be, hey, in order for me to make my argument, I need to make it in a way that 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 kind of makes that improbable. Um, mm-hmm. That, that kind of makes it improbable that God could have all of all of these reasons. Or you need to change your argument and use it, put forward an argument that doesn't depend on on that kind of assumption. But yeah, yeah. It's, and, uh, and I mean, but, in addition to this, we've we've only been talking about skeptical theism, but there are other ways to respond to the argument, like introduce some type of reason that God would have for allowing these, these real terrible things. Yeah. The Odyssey. So yeah. Theodicies. So there's, there's other ways to respond that doesn't rely on this. So if you have a problem with skeptical theism, you don't necessarily have to take that route, but I, I agree with you that it is probably the major reason why people have, have uh, turned away from offering that version of it. So let's turn now to the Bayesian version of the, of the argument, if you're comfortable doing that. And then we'll move oh, to some Q and A. Oh yeah. Uh, let, let me just, let me just give one more point on, on what you just, on what you just said. Um, that, you know, you could still give arguments for why God allows suffering. And here I think is another, it's a different kind. It's a different kind uh, of, of point as far as skeptical theism is concerned is suppose, suppose someone says, I believe that God allows all this suffering because God has a, you know, really high regard for free will. And because um, in order for human beings to develop and become and develop virtues and so on, they need to go through some stuff. If you look at the people in your life who are the most spoiled, horrible human beings are usually people who got everything they wanted in life and they can't even get their minds around not getting it. And so 
the, if you look at the the best people you ever you've ever met, there are usually people who who had to go through some stuff. We develop morally by mm -hmm. going through different struggles and so on. And the you know the the response, the response, and I get this, I get I get why this is the response. But the the you know the atheist response is, come on, really, all of this, God's allowing for 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 those reasons. But if we're talking about skeptical theism here. You should be thinking along the lines of, well, could one, if if there are some goods that I'm aware of that come out of this, could God have additional ones that I'm not aware of? Certainly, if theism were true, that, that would obviously be the case. So if there are certain good states of affairs that seem to depend on bad states of affairs, is it possible that there are vastly more than these? Well, uh, yes. So, so that's one problem. Two, which I think lots of people ignore, do you think it's possible that God's values are somehow different from yours. I think this is one of the main problems that, that, uh, Hud Hudson people, points that out too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, no, I'm thinking just, I'm thinking in very, very simple terms here. Like I'll post a video and uh -huh. I will get, I will get a message from someone, David, I like all your other videos, but I hate this one. Stop doing this. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I got to, you know, this is 99.5% uh, approval rating, 99.5% thumbs up likes. And you're saying, don't do this anymore because you don't like it. Well, it seems that there are people who can't even get their minds around the idea that other people might have values that are different from theirs. And that just because they really, really like something or really, really dislike something doesn't mean that that's the way things are or the way things ought to be. Lots of people just can't get their minds around this. They think, no, this is this is what I like and this is what I just dislike. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is the order. This is the order that I would place these goods. And so the most important good is this. And the next most important would be this. And the next most important would be this. And the next most important would be this. And they really think, well, that's how everyone else needs to be. And with the argument from from evil, it's and that's how God would be if God existed. He God would have the you know those those good states of affairs. That would be the God's priorities. Up, oh, but I don't see, I don't see God doing things the way I would want Him to, and therefore, therefore God probably doesn't exist. When here again, whether you're theist or non-theist or whatever, there is a healthy kind of skepticism here. Of you know, hey, here's what I like, and one. Lots of people would think differently, and I, I should be considering the possibility, one, that God's sort of value system would be very different from mine, and and two, that God is, is aware of all kinds of things that, that I'm not aware of. This, this, this doesn't mean theism is true or that there's no problem of evil. It's just if you're saying you have an argument against the existence of God, you should be aware of these things, and you should be trying to formulate an argument that doesn't depend on assumptions that, that just make no sense. All right, let's move on to the next one. The Bayesian and I've got argument. the slide. Should, yeah, should I put it up? Should I put the slide up? Uh, yeah, put put the slide up and have that there for a couple minutes, and I'll kind of break it all down. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're new to this, this is going to look confusing at first, but we will explain all of this in here, and then it will be clear, and then you'll have an idea of, of a kind of Bayesian argument from evil. And what's cool is the Bayesian argument from evil, for the it avoids the problems of the logical version of the argument. And once you flesh it out, it avoids the problem of the inductive versions of the argument. So it doesn't have those problems. Uh, once you, once you understand what's being claimed, it doesn't, it doesn't rely on the claim that if God had reasons for doing things, we would somehow be aware of them. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the argument. Again, this looks confused. I'll just read through it once, and then we'll talk about what all this stuff is. So one E is known to be true. And E there is going to be some sort of evidence about human and animal suffering in the world, something along those lines. You can put all sorts of different things in for E. Premise two, the probability of E given N is much greater than, so it's greater with an exclamation point, meaning much greater than the probability of E given T. And so here there are different values you can put in for N. Uh, there I put N because we'll just, we'll just talk about naturalism. Here the claim is the probability of this evidence, human and animal suffering, let's say, given the assumption that naturalism is true, is much greater than the probability of this evidence 
given theism or given the assumption that that theism is true. So we'll, we'll break this down even more. Again, this will this will this will be confusing for a couple of minutes and then you'll understand everything that's in there and you'll understand the argument and then we're all we're all good to go. Uh, premise three. T, which is theism, theism is not much more probable intrinsically than naturalism. So N is theism is not much more probable intrinsically than naturalism. And the conclusion, therefore, all else held equal, theism is probably false. Now, what what Draper has done here, and this isn't specifically Draper's had Draper has multiple versions of the argument. So sometimes he uses naturalism, sometimes he uses some other alternative hypothesis, but the, the hypothesis the, of indifference. This is the base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's the one he originally came out with, which is, uh, which um, it's, 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 it's a stronger argument, I think, than this one, and, and lines up more with uh, Hume's argument in the dialogues. But it's not, it's not something people are familiar with. If you say the hypothesis of indifference, then you have to explain the hypothesis. Whereas naturalism, most people nowadays understand what what naturalism is. Yeah. So. Um, Let's just go through these and we'll see how how he how he breaks this down is basically he divides things up. Um, let's look at premise three first. So theism is not much more probable intrinsically than naturalism. So one of the issues to consider when you're examining a hypothesis, so a hypothesis that, you know, God exists or a hypothesis that naturalism is true, once you're. Um, oh, we're, we're going to be looking at that multiple times. So I'll keep uh, it up then. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, uh, one of the things that you need to focus on is, is what's called the intrinsic, hypo uh, the intrinsic probability of the hypothesis. So the intrinsic probability of the hypothesis, this just means before you actually examine the evidence, independent of the evidence, a hypothesis could be more or less probable. And just to give an example here. Uh, this usually has to do with how simple the hypothesis is or how complex. The more you pack into a hypothesis, then prior to investigation, prior to examining the evidence, the more you pack into a hypothesis or the more specific it is, the less probable it is intrinsically. So just to give an example here, if I say that there's an animal outside my door, well, that will have a certain level of probability. So th again, this is before I open the door, assuming that I know nothing at all about what is behind my door right now. If I say my hypothesis is that there is an animal behind the door, well, that will have some certain level of probability. Could be an insect, could be one of my kids, who knows. The more specific I get, then the less probable it is intrinsically. So we're not considering what the actual evidence is. We're just saying the intrinsic probability, the probability of it just based on how much I pack into it. So if I say there's an animal behind the door, that is less specific than if I say there's a mammal behind the door. And uh, if I say there's a mammal behind the door, that's less specific than if I say there's a dog behind the door. And if I say there's a dog behind the door, that, that's less specific than me saying there's a poodle behind the door with a broken leg and a patch over one eye and it's holding such and such squeaky toy or something like that, right? Notice the more specific I get, the more there is that could be false about the hypothesis. And so this is what you're talking about with intrinsic probability. So apart from actually going out and examining the evidence, how probable is the hypothesis based on how specific it is and how much information that there is packed into it. So for comparing two hypotheses like naturalism and theism, we have concerns about which, which hypothesis the evidence supports. But uh, even before that, even before we consider the evidence, there's another consideration based on how much is packed into these hypotheses because you could have evidence that, sp that gives some support to one hypothesis, but if the other one already starts off as massively more intrinsically probable, then you have to consider whether this evidence somehow outweighs that issue. So Draper doesn't argue that naturalism um, or that some other hypothesis like the hypothesis of indifference, he doesn't argue that these, these hypotheses are much more intrinsically probable than theism. He just points out that whatever the case may be, it's not the case that theism is somehow far more intrinsically probable than these other ones. So it doesn't have some massive advantage starting out. And the reasoning would be theism 
is a very specific hypothesis with respect to one being and that being's relationship to the universe. You're saying that a, an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good being exists. That is very, very specific claim to make. And that this being is connected to the universe in such a way that this being you know, created the universe. So that is a very specific hypothesis, whereas naturalism naturalism is specific in the sense of sort of its negative commitments. It's saying that there is there's nothing of a certain kind, right? There's nothing beyond the natural world or something like that, depending on how we define naturalism. So if you want a comparison here, um, if I said there is a human-like species on some planet in the Andromeda galaxy, well, there I'm saying that there's something prior to investigation. So we haven't actually gone out and seen it. Prior to investigation, if I say there's a human-like species somewhere in the Andromeda galaxy, well, that's a very specific kind of claim. I'm claiming that it's, it's human-like and that it, it exists out there. Versus if I said there's no life at all in the Andromeda galaxy, well, there it's, it's kind of a negative claim. I'm saying that nothing of a certain sort exists. And it's kind of hard to really defend those kinds of probabilities in, in terms of saying, well, this one is much more probable than that one. But Draper here, Draper makes a good move. So this is a modest claim. Um, Cameron pointed out that modesty is modesty is a, a, a positive when it comes to things like this. But Draper says, he simply says that theism isn't much more intrinsically probable than naturalism. So it doesn't have some sort of huge advantage. It's making a very specific claim. And so it doesn't have some huge advantage prior to examining the evidence. So the question then becomes, what happens when we examine the evidence? Well, premise one is true. E is known to be true. So whatever evidence we want to put in there, um, you know, some pattern of human and animal suffering that we see around us in the world. So, you know, natural evil, moral evil, there's tons of evil and suffering in the world. You could put whatever you want for E. Two is, premise two is really, this is, th that looks complicated. It's not complicated. It's a comparison. All this is saying, yeah. All this is saying is the probability of, having this kind of suffering all around us is much more probable if we assume that naturalism is true than it is if we assume that theism is true. And why is that? Well, if naturalism is true, there's nothing looking out for us. There's nothing, you know, ready to intervene and protect us from harm. There's none of that. And so if naturalism were true, it shouldn't be surprising at all to us that the world is full of suffering. If there's, if there's no higher being that's looking out for us and protecting us, uh, and we're sort of natural creatures, and we develop through a struggle for survival and so on, survival of the fittest, well, obviously there's going to be a, a ton of suffering in the world. So it shouldn't be surprising at all on the assumption that naturalism is true. But you could say it's much more surprising that we have all of this suffering around us if theism is true. Why? Well, you have a being who created us all and set this world up and is capable of intervening in any way he wants to protect us from this suffering, to protect children, to protect us from natural disasters. Yeah, you could say, well, maybe there are reasons for God to allow this suffering and so on, but that doesn't change the fact that if you just started out with the hypothesis. So, so here, here, here's a little exercise that, that you would perform in order to get your mind around uh, what this means. This is called the surprise principle. Um, but Let's let's pretend that you didn't know that the world is filled with tons of suffering. And you just think about the hypotheses, naturalism and theism. If you just sit back and think, OK, if naturalism is true, apart from me, let me pretend I didn't know anything about the suffering in the world. If I didn't know that this world was filled with suffering and I assume that naturalism is true and then all of a sudden I open my eyes and I look around, and I see all this suffering. How surprising would that suffering be? And you could say, well, not very surprising, not very surprising. I would I would expect all this. I mean, I wouldn't be, be extremely specific in what I would expect, but it wouldn't be terribly surprising. Whereas if I just start out with the claim that an all knowing, all powerful, perfectly good being created this. And all of a sudden I open my eyes and I see all the stuff that's going around, going on around, uh, going on around us in the world. Is that surprising? Well, yeah, might, might might be pretty surprising. You might say, whoa, you know, I might have expected some. I might have expected that God would allow some 
you know, rebellion based on free will or something. But gosh, look around us. This is this is messed up. So he's not notice he's not claiming that God can't have reasons or something like that. It's just the evidence is much less surprising if you start off with naturalism than it is if you start off with theism. And let's get that slide up one more time just so we can look at the conclusion, how this how this all follows. So premise one, the evidence is known to be true. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. We know that there's a lot of human and animal suffering around us. Premise two, the probability of all of this human and animal suffering on the assumption that, that naturalism is true is much greater than the probability of all of this evidence on the assumption that theism is true. And so basically there you'd say that the, the evidence favors one hypothesis over another. The evidence supports naturalism over theism. Three, uh, theism didn't start out with some huge advantage over naturalism. T is not much more probable intrinsically than naturalism. And premise four, therefore all else held equal, T is probably false. Now notice, all else held equal, T is probably false. What that means is, there could be other evidence. There could be other evidence out there that outweighs this evidence. But if we, if all else is equal, then theism would have to be probably false. And notice this doesn't mean that naturalism is true. Using this method, you don't show which hypothesis is true. You just show that one is probably false. And the reason you can show that one is probably false is, uh, but not show that the other one is probably true, is you can imagine a situation where you have a hypothesis that has a probability of 0.01 or, or 1%. And you could show that another hypothesis is, is far more probable. It fits the evidence much better. But maybe that other hypothesis has a probability of 0.1 or 10%. Well, the hypothesis that the hypothesis with a probability of, of 0.1 is, is far more probable than the hypothesis that has a probability of 0.01, but that doesn't mean that it's probably true. In fact, it wouldn't be, a, it would be probably false. But what it would mean is the hypothesis that is far less probable probably isn't true. It could be, it's possible that it's true, but it's, it's probably not because it's less probable than another hypothesis, which may or may not be true. And so all he's saying here is, yes, there you could look at other evidence and outweigh this evidence, but basically he flips it back on the theist here. So here's, this is the true relationship. So the claim goes, this is the relationship between the, the suffering or evil or whatever we want to call it around us in the world and theism. It serves as some kind of evidence that theism is false. You theists could outweigh this evidence by showing that there's even greater evidence for theism, but until you do, if we just hold all other evidence equal, we pretend that the evidence is, is balanced for other things, then theism is probably false. So notice he basically flips it back on the theist here to say, okay, here's the impact of this evidence on your view. So what do you have that's going to outweigh this problem of this this version of the problem of evil what evidence do you have that will outweigh all of this so that is uh, that's one example of a bayesian argument from evil but this is a uh, this is a pretty general form that uh that these arguments are going to follow yeah so what what how do you respond to this one do you do you go the route of being like well then we just look at more ag more evidence more arguments for god's existence that are going to ultimately outweigh it? Or do you attack one of the premises? What do you, what, do, what is your preferred approach? And then we'll, we'll do some Q and A. Yeah, there are, there are lots of, there are lots of problems. I have multiple chapters, um, in my dissertation. I had some chapters on problems that other people had pointed out and problems, uh, some problems that I saw, but just to give you, I'll, I'll give a couple of quick examples about problems that other people saw. The, yeah, uh, I wanted to point of, out real quick before you do that, that like it, to, to me, it seems like two and three premises, two and three could both be objected to like one. I think you even mentioned that one. I think pretty much everyone's going to agree is true, but then two and three seem like there's, there's gotta be a whole lot of work done to, to show that those are more likely than not. But anyways, yeah. is that, yeah, there, 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 are, there are a few things here. So, I mean, as far as Bayesian, as far as Bayesian reasoning is concerned, uh, notice when you say that the probability of theism is greater or less than the probability of this, these aren't situations where 
you're talking about some specific numerical probability, right? It's like if I say, you know, what are the odds that I that I flip heads on this coin? Well, that's okay. There are two possible outcomes and one desired outcome. I can I can know I know exactly what the probability there is. What's the probability of that an omnipotent, omniscient, uh, perfectly good being exists? Is not something that you say. Oh, the probability is this. Same thing with naturalism. It's not something that you say there's a numerical probability. So. You know, these these probabilities that you start out with are going to be kind of subjective. And Bayesianism is actually fine with that. As long as you kind of update your the, as, as far as long as you update your probabilities in the right way, then Bayesianism is usually fine with you starting off with, you know, probabilities based on some some sort of you know, a subjective uh, criteria. Um, as long as you're updating it in light of the evidence. But there there are some issues. Let, let me go ahead and point out a, a couple of problems that other people have have pointed out. And um, But the, the first response that I read to Draper's argument is one of the reasons I actually started focusing on this argument was I thought the response was lame and didn't really, under, didn't really get the argument. So um, one of the early responses, I think this was Richard Otta, um, been out of this for a, for, a, for a few years, but I think it was Richard Otta who argued that if you change the hypothesis to something like Christianity, you get different results. So um, here, here the response was, yes, you're inserting theism into this, but imagine you, your hypothesis is Christianity. So can you say that the that the amount of suffering we see around us is more probable on naturalism than it is on Christianity. Well, if Christianity is true, then we're in a world where people are in rebellion against God, and God said that we were going to suffer from our rebellion and so on, and so you would expect the suffering that we see around us in the world. And so that was one of the early responses to Draper's paper. Hey, if you put, if you put a different hypothesis in, something like theism, or you could put Islam in there, um, if Islam is true, is the suffering around us surprising? No, of course not. We're in rebellion against our creator and so on. And so obviously there are going to be problems. So uh, I didn't think that was a good response. And Draper actually responded to that. But his response usually doesn't uh, doesn't uh, appear. But the problem with that is once you insert Christianity, now you no longer have the idea that something like the hypothesis of indifference or even naturalism isn't much more intrinsically uh, well th that that Christianity isn't uh, much more intrinsically probable, right? Because um, Christianity it, is a I, whole lot more complex than just bare it's theism. Massive. If, yeah, if you're taking Christianity as like you know the claim that everything in the Bible happened and that the fall and all this stuff, that is a massively, massively, massively specific and complex theory. You have a ton of stuff packed into it. So prior to investigation prior to seeing whether the whether Christianity is actually true, a, a much simpler hypothesis is going to be far, 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 far more intrinsically probable than that. And so you just end up with a different kind of problem. You need, okay, well, if you don't want to outweigh the evidence from evil, then you have to outweigh, you know, the evidence that this this other hypothesis is far more probable intrinsically than yours. So how do you outweigh that? So the kind of result will be the same. You need to establish uh, a lot of evidence for your hypothesis. So that wasn't very good. Uh, a more interesting one was put out by Alvin Plantinga, where Plantinga just tends to give parallel arguments to show that there is a problem with the reasoning. So Plantinga starts with um, something like this. Plantinga says, OK, um, Let's start off with the evidence being the evidence claim. So the E is that there's a dog within 10 feet of me. And let my two hypotheses be one, I'm in my office, or two, I'm in a dog kennel. So my hypothesis, my hypotheses are one, I'm in my office, and two, I'm in a dog kennel. And my evidence is there's a dog within 10 feet of me. So well, guess what? The prior to actually any sort of investigation, the evidence that there's a dog within 10 feet of me is much more probable on the assumption that I'm in a dog kennel than it is on the assumption that I'm in my office. You know, we usually don't expect dogs to be in someone's office. And so um, whereas you do expect dogs to be around if you're in a dog kennel. And so Plantinga says, should I therefore conclude that I'm not in my office? because of that particular evidence. 
And most of us would would, would say no, because Planning is he's writing he's writing that paper in his office, and he says, "But my dog is sitting here. My dog like my dog comes and sits down in my office sometimes." So, the the problem here: how much evidence are you actually providing? Are are you providing ev- by zeroing in on one particular piece of evidence and saying, "Well, that's more probable on this hypothesis than on that one." Therefore, you need evidence to outweigh it. How much evidence is this? Uh, is this giving you? And Draper's response to that is, well, of course, if the only thing you are aware of was that there's a dog within 10 feet of you, that would support the hypothesis that you're in a kennel over another hypothesis. But you have the benefit of looking around you and seeing that that you're in your office. And so, yes, that evidence by itself would point in one direction, but you have a bunch of, all evidence is not equal. All evidence is not equal. And so you theists, you theists, what is your overriding evidence that outweighs the evidence from evil in the same way that, you know, planning a looking around and seeing that he's in his office outweighs the fact that this evidence would be more probable if he were in a dog kennel than than otherwise. So um, I think Draper is right in that sense that, you know, planning does have other evidence. The point is. What, what's really relevant there about planning critique there is that. If we could do that, we could do that with anything, right? You could have you could have any hypotheses, and you could always zero in on some piece of evidence that would favor a different hypothesis over over that hypothesis. Mm-hmm. How much stock should you put in that, right? If you can do that with if you can do that any time, if you can if any time I give you a hypothesis, you could say, well, here's an here's another hypothesis, and I'm going to look around and oh, this particular piece of evidence would fit better with that alternative hypothesis. Therefore. Well, if you can always do that, then how much evidence is it? And, you know, there's something there's something wrong about that. And there's something right about that. There's, there's something wrong about that in the sense that we it seems like the amount of human and animal suffering we see around us should be part of of an argument. But if you can always use this approach, then how much evidence does it actually count as? And so here you're just planning is just responding to the approach in general of saying, Hey, these hypotheses are, you know, the hypothesis, notice the hypothesis I'm in my office versus I'm, you know, I'm in a dog kennel. As far as intrinsic probability, there's not, there's not a big difference there. Um, and the evidence would favor one over another. So how much, why should you take these kinds of arguments seriously is, is planning this point. Why should you take that as a concern? In other words, if I have a hypothesis that I believe and someone says, ah, but this particular piece of evidence would favor some other hypothesis, why shouldn't I just say, I don't care. You can do that with any hypothesis I believe. You can do that with anything I believe. You can always point out something that would fit better with some other hypothesis. So those are uh, those are some of the um, those are some of the points that were that were brought up. And I think I have maybe six or seven chapters um, that are, that go through some other people's responses to um, to Draper, and then and then I have I forget six or seven that are. That are my own. Let, let me go ahead and give you sort of the the main one, the the problem, the, the main problem that I see it. Again, there are, there are a bunch. Before but. you do that, before you do that, let me pull in a comment here from Landon Matochos. He says Cameron is currently seriously regretting bringing this guy on the show. Just wanted to let you know yeah, that. Yeah, for real. <laughs> you feel <laughs> stupid now. <laughs> no, I. I Personally, I, I love this conversation because I, the problem of evil is something that I've actually done some work on myself. I've uh, I did a debate with the guy Justin Schieber when he was still doing uh, atheistic apologetics, and I had a debate with him. It, it was it was really fun. He he's a really smart guy, and I, I th- he brought in a lot of Draper's arguments and and some yeah. other people. So I I was I've had the opportunity to look at pretty pretty deeply into this. Probably not nearly as deeply as you doing a, a whole you know PhD on it, but. Uh, I still really enjoy the the whole argument. I, I I just enjoy looking at arguments against theism. Anyways, just it's uh, sort of a pastime for me. Yeah, it's and, a, it's and, a, oh, go ahead. No, I was I was done. Oh, no, yeah, I, 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 I just, just, let I me just say, just say that, that. I, I'm super enjoying this. The, the comment that I put up there was just a it was a joke. I, I wanted to point out how ridiculous it was because I actually uh, I'm loving every second of this. This is this is good stuff. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of like you in the in the in the sense that I mean one of the main reasons I focused on this was everyone was saying everyone who was defending the evidential I mean uh, the the probabilistic or inductive version of the argument was saying that the logical argument from evil failed, but then you had William Rowe and Paul Draper saying that the popular version of 
the evidential argument from evil also fails because it relies on this relies on this uh, assumption that we would be aware of God's reasons for doing things. And uh, they're saying that there's this new argument which avoids these problems. So I, I'm just thinking, well, if this is the argument, if they're saying that other arguments from evil fail, and this is the one to go with, and they're basically saying this is the most powerful and persuasive version of the argument from evil that we have. So if this one's actually good, then you know, hey, this is this is the best argument there is against theism based on evil to date. And if this argument actually fails, well, then there is none, right? Then you can say, you know, I really don't feel good about evil or I, I have a big problem with God allowing so much evil in the world. But as far as actually using it in an argument, you can't, it doesn't work. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. And that's always, that's always interesting. The idea that something can have a kind of impression on you, but if you try to make an argument um, based on it, then it doesn't always, it doesn't always work out. So yes, yeah, same ballpark as far as, Hey, let's, let's take a look at this argument and see what's kind of the best that, uh, that atheists and agnostics and so on. What's the best case you can make against, against theism. So uh, the, the real yeah, give me, you were about to give me, you're about to give me like one more thing and then we got to get to some questions. Yeah. I'll, I'll give, I'll give kind of i uh, I'll give kind of two real quick, um, that, that okay. are, that are, that are connected. But one is, one notice you could totally you could totally flip this argument just by inserting different evidence, right? So notice you could do this with cosmic fine tuning, right? The fine tuning of the cosmos that the uh, the constants of the cosmos that that are used in physics they seem very 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 fine tuned to allow life, and so. You, as a naturalist, you can say, well, you know, we got lucky or there's a multiverse or you can say something out there in order to, in order to make those things, uh, in order to reconcile that with your belief. But notice the, the, the exact same argument would, would follow in reverse, right? You say, well, naturalism isn't much more improbable, much more probable intrinsically than theism. The evidence is known to be true. We know that, you know, these constants are the values that, that they have, but the evidence would be much less surprising on theism than it is on naturalism. In other words, if the universe is created by God to produce life, then what are the odds that the constants of physics are going to be finely tuned to support life? Well, very, 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 very extremely high, right? What are the, what's the probability that these constants would be where they are if naturalism is true? Well, very, very low. These you can actually come up with some mathematical probabilities, extremely low. So here's a case where the evidence massively favors theism over naturalism, and so you could do the kind of exact same argument and, ju and just and just flip it in reverse, and therefore say um, that uh, okay, I just canceled out your your evidence against uh, uh, against theism by balancing it, and. You could notice you could do this not just by go, coming in at the end and saying, aha, but I've given this other reason to think that naturalism isn't more probable than theism. You can actually combine the evidence and then the argument doesn't go anywhere. Right. So and by the way, I actually I actually gave this argument um, at, at a meeting at the national meeting of the uh, Society of Christian Philosophers and, and Draper was right there. Um, but think about this. If you take that argument and you see the evidence is known to be true, well, guess what? Suppose your evidence is tons of human and animal suffering and fine tuning. So you take that as one evidence thing. The universe is finely tuned for life and there's lots of human and animal suffering. Well, then you can't say that the evidence is much less surprising on naturalism than on theism. You just have to say, I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be like your personal preference on which which direction the evidence points. It's going to depend on which evidence you find more persuasive or, more, or stronger, whether it's uh, cosmic fine tuning or or evil. And so the argument doesn't doesn't follow. And so notice just by by changing your hypothesis or by changing the evidence statement, you can get all kinds of different results. And so you can any time someone says, oh, this particular piece of evidence favors this over that, you can say, well, yeah, but if I insert some additional evidence in there, then it doesn't favor it anymore. And so here again, why should I take your argument as some sort of serious problem for my belief when all I have to do is insert a little bit more evidence in there of a different kind and the argument just 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 falls apart. So that's a that's sort of one kind of thing. But what, what I want to say, and this is this is kind of this is a lot of my thought on this issue. Um, 
when you take something like this and you say this evidence, this evidence from human and animal suffering favors naturalism over theism, I would say in one sense, maybe, but in another sense, definitely not, because everything that's assumed in order for you to have this human and animal suffering is evidence that would favor theism over naturalism. In other words, in order to have this kind of human and animal suffering, then one, you need a universe. And I would say a universe coming into existence massively favors theism over naturalism. Two, you need the fine tuning, cosmic fine tuning in order to support life. I'd say that massively supports theism over naturalism. Uh, three, you need actual life. You can have a, you can build a house. That doesn't mean you actually have life. So even if you fine tune the universe, you still don't get life. So getting very complex biology that favors theism over naturalism. Um, you can even get more specific with like, uh, you know, conscious creatures like ourselves arising spontaneously, even if you say it could happen, well, it's much more probable if you have a creator that's creating these sort of things. In other words, everything you actually need in order to make this argument from evil, everything that's presupposed in the argument favors theism over naturalism. And so there's something weird to me about saying, that all this human and animal suffering points to naturalism over theism. And so what, what, I would, what I would say is, depends on what you mean. If you mean, hey, let's assume that we aren't aware that everything that is necessary for this argument favors theism over naturalism. Yes, I can see you saying, look at, it, look at, all, this, you know, look at all this pain and suffering in the world. This is less surprising on naturalism than it is on theism. I can see you saying that, but why? Why would we do that? Why would we say, hey, yeah, everything that's necessary in order to have this human and animal suffering and everything that's necessary for this argument to go through favors theism over naturalism. And yet somehow the entire argument favors naturalism over theism and therefore theism is, is probably false, all else held equal. Something strange going on there. So that's, yeah, that's as far as this type of reasoning, that's why I say, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do a lot at best at, at best. It's some small amount of evidence that can be easily outweighed. And what I, what, what I, what I really want to say here is there's got to be a better argument from evil, right? It's how do you formulate it? Because we look around and, you know, this is, this is stuff that is directly relevant to my life. I have five sons, two of them have a terminal illness. They've had a lot of suffering in their life. And so, you know, you multiply that times tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of instances around the world and of all kinds of, you know, of all different kinds. And I want to say that there's, there's got to be a better argument here for the atheist. It's just, it's just how you actually formulate it and then show that your argument stands up to criticism. But uh, I, I want to say kind of that this is better than the earlier versions because it doesn't have their shortcomings. And yet, seems like there could be a stronger argument. I'm just not sure what it is. All right. With that, let's go to some questions from Sentinel Apologetics. Thank you for your super chat. I'm waiting for it to pull up on the screen. There it is. Can theology enter this topic? Revelation 21, 1 ends with no more C. C equals chaos. Does the incarnation, hypostasis of logos, flesh via resurrection, Theosis solve the age-old question of chaos. Kampf? What is that word? Kampf. Kampf. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, theology can definitely enter uh, enter the topic, and uh, but as far as this argument is concerned, as far as Draper's argument is concerned, that would all just that would all come in. That would all come in. Um, after the conclusion of his argument. So you could say, hey, um, yes, this argument, if you just examine it, would provide such and such, and such an amount of evidence against theism. But here's why that doesn't uh, refute Christianity. It doesn't refute Christianity because I know that Christianity is true because of this, 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 and this, and that. And, um, and therefore, it, it, it would come down to what positive evidence do you have that outweighs it? And Draper Draper is perfectly willing to grant that. He doesn't grant that the evidence for Christianity outweighs it. It's just that if you have good reasons to think that Christianity is true, then it would be entirely possible for you to 
um, to outweigh the evidence. So yes, all of that, all of that stuff is relevant. Discussions of you have theodicies, so the claim that God allows these things because of free will, or God allows them, you know, to build human souls and help us develop morally and spiritually and so on. Those are kind of philosophical reasons. But then you have your religious specific responses. So this would be like things like human beings are in rebellion against God. And uh, so we're sinners and things like that. And so those are also those are also a part of our, our thinking on this topic. So yes, of course, as a as a Christian, then scripture would be part of your reasoning on this topic. And, and basically what we're all trying to do is we all have all the evidence around us, right? We, we, all, we all have the same evidence. Sometimes we have access to evidence that other people don't have access to. But in general, we're pretty familiar with the world around us. And the question is, how do we, how do we make sense of this world? And uh, as a Christian, you're going to do that in, in one way. And as an atheist, you're going to do that in a different way. Okay, here's another question from, whoops, my screen just went all over the place. Let me see what's going on here. Okay, here we go. From Gideon Dil Dilget. Thank you for your super chat. He says, what is the strongest counter to your position on evil? To my position on evil? Um, I don't know what you mean, my position on evil. As far as the stuff we're talking about here, we're looking for strong arguments, and that's pretty much all you do in philosophy. You give an argument, and other people try to rip it apart, and the goal mm -hmm. is to get to the goal is to get to stronger and stronger, um, stronger and stronger arguments. So, I mean, if you mean my position as a Christian, it would just be showing, you know, showing that Christianity is is false. If if Christianity is if Christianity is true, then well, guess what? The the evil and suffering we see around us makes a lot of sense. You might want to think specifically in terms of, even if you think, you know, we're in a world of rebellion, why does it seem so often that, that, uh, there's not a lot of reason behind the targets of the suffering. In other words, if there were lots of suffering, but it was like, you know, drug dealers and murderers and robbers and stuff, and they were the ones who had the bulk of the suffering, then you could say, aha, it looks like, looks like there's a pattern here. The worse you are, the worse you are, the more you suffer. And that is sometimes the pattern that we see. But at other times you see the most innocent and the nicest and the gentlest are suffering horribly. And then you'll see really, really horrible people getting away with it through throughout their life. And so if you, if you were to say, what's the biggest problem, um, that's probably what I would go with. I would say it doesn't seem like there's anything that's that's selecting who catches this suffering. It seems random, and that would seem to support something like naturalism over theism. That doesn't mean that that theism is false. It's just you know the theist has to have other explanations or evidence that outweighs this. So a theist would want to respond, yeah, but you know even good people, the, the whole world, the the world is in rebellion. The world is fallen. Things like that, and so. Um, yeah, you could lots of different directions you could go with that. But if I were to really push my case against theism, it would be it wouldn't just be, hey, there's lots of suffering. It would be kind of the distribution of the suffering. If you look at how it's distributed, it doesn't look like there's a lot of reason behind it. And so if you're a theist or if you're a Christian, you have to come up with an explanation that kind of incorporates that. And and theism theism does and Christianity does. And so this is why it's going to come back to what evidence do you have that that Christianity is true because you can always you can always pack the things you know into your hypothesis, right? You can pack the things you know into your hypothesis. That doesn't mean that your your hypothesis is is true. So I think it comes down to what evidence you have for Christianity. Okay, this is a question from Aiden Peterson. He's a, a supporter of ours. Hey David, if one endorses skeptical theism, what implications do you think this has for natural theology? Are inductive arguments out of the window? Um, no, you, you, you would have to be more modest. And by the way, this is, this is really the brilliance of Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion. Lots of atheists and skeptics read it and they don't get it and they, they think they get it and they don't get it at all, but they're not getting a much more brilliant point that he's making than the stupid points they think he's making. So your, your average atheist reads Hume's dialogues and he's, attacking the design argument and he's defending the problem of evil. And then in the end, when 
he says, oh, when I was attacking the design argument, I was kind of just joking. And they say, oh, he's just saying that because he, he didn't want to be killed or something. That, that was that was that was published posthumously. So well, what, what do you what do you think he was doing that for? Oh, because, you know, he wasn't trying to hurt anyone's feelings. This is humor talking about. It. He loved hurting people's feelings. What are you talking about here? Um, if you look at the argument he's actually making, brilliant, 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 brilliant argument. Hume's point is this. You theists, you th you could take this as a criticism both of atheism and of theism. He's saying, look, you theists, what you do is you say, when you're looking at design in nature, you're saying, look at all this evidence. We have to go where the evidence points. We can't be skeptics when it comes to this evidence. This evidence clearly points to a designer. And so he plays skeptic in there to show that the theist is really gonna put his foot down and say, stop being so skeptical. You just have to go with the evidence. Look at all the evidence. It so clearly points to theism, right? Then what happens? He switches to all the suffering we see around us. And then what he shows is suddenly the theist becomes a skeptic. Oh, well, maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of that. Maybe it's because of this. Maybe there's an explanation. Maybe I don't know, but don't go where the evidence points. Right? So he's pointing out that theists are basically inconsistent skeptics, right? But so are atheists, right? The, the atheist says, look at all this evidence from evil and suffering around us. Look at all this evidence. Oh my goodness, so much suffering. Clearly a God doesn't exist. And then you point out, you know, arguments from, you know, cosmological arguments or design arguments. Suddenly they become very skeptical of those kinds of arguments. They, there's very, no, don't go with the, don't go where the evidence points there. So he's basically pointing out you have all of these inconsistent skeptics. And what he does by the end, what he does by the end in book 11, um, he, po he points out that he, there are basically two possibilities. You can either be a, a real skeptic and just say, I don't know. I don't know how the universe got. I don't know if there's intelligence behind it or I don't know if this this evidence from evil refutes that. I don't know any of that. I'm, I'm just I'm a, I'm a, I'm a skeptic, man. I, I'm skeptical about my ability to understand these kinds of things. You can either be a skeptic, in which case you shouldn't be defending atheism. You shouldn't be defending theism. You should just say, I don't know. Or you can be consistent about the evidence. And he has kind of three, he has kind of three things there. One, he, he says he really can't take objections to design and nature seriously, saying, I, look, I can play devil's advocate, but I can't, I can't really, obviously, obviously there's a designer here. So that's one. Two, he, he doesn't really talk about this earlier, but the uniformity of nature points to sort of one, sort of one designer. In other words, you don't go to different places and find different rules. So that seems to suggest that it's not a, a bunch of different beings creating. So not polytheism. It's not a bunch of different beings creating things. Um, it seems to be one. And three, he, point, he points out that uh, it, all the suffering we see around us. So Hume's conclusion is if you really want to go where the evidence points, if you really want to go where the evidence points, then you'd say that there is one intelligent designer of the universe, although a kind of intelligence that we can't really understand because it's vastly beyond us, one intelligent designer who just does not care about us at all. He's saying that's where you go with the evidence, right? So, th and by the way, this is where Draper draws the uh, hypothesis of indifference. Whatever the cause of the universe is, it's indifferent to us. And so um, Hume's main point is along the lines of, of, what, uh, of what Aiden just pointed out. If you're going to be skeptical, if you're going to be skeptical of, if you're going to be skeptical when atheists come at you with an argument from evil, shouldn't you also be skeptical when people are using design arguments and, and things like that? So Hume's, that argument, I think, is much more brilliant than, oh, he's attacking the design argument, which he says, he says later, he doesn't even, he doesn't even really believe those, those criticisms. Uh, he's making that much more brilliant point that, look, either be a skeptic and say you don't know, you just don't understand, or be consistent and don't say, hey, the universe is created by an intelligent designer. It's created by an intelligent designer who doesn't care about us. And so it's not your God. It's not the God that you're thinking of. I think that's a much, much, uh, much more sophisticated argument than what we often find. But as far as as far as uh, are we being inconsistent and going to, you know, when we go to natural theology? Well, a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism would cause you to not make more of an argument than you can. In other words, design and biology, you'd have to conclude intelligence. If you make a really good argument, you'd have to conclude intelligence. So you can't just come in and say, aha, therefore the God of, of theism. And so there you'd have to piece it together, but it would just be basically going 
beyond, don't go beyond what the evidence actually shows. Because when you're talking about skeptical theism, notice this isn't simply I'm being skeptical of this argument from evil. It's I'm skeptical of the claim that I would be aware of God's reasons for doing things. Well, guess what? That That's just any level of skepticism should, should agree with that, right? So this isn't when you look at design and nature and you say, and someone gives you an argument for the probabilities here, when you look at the, the argument from fine tuning and you look at the probabilities, it, it's not just simply a matter of being skeptical. You have to be really, 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 really skeptical to avoid some of the problems that are generated for your atheism with, with these probabilities. When you're talking about skeptical theism, this isn't saying, hey, I'm ignoring all the evidence around me. It's saying, I have to, I, I can't take seriously the claim that I would be aware of God's reasons for, for doing things. Uh, I can't take that seriously. And so, yeah, I think healthy dose of skepticism across the board, but I think, I think generally theistic philosophers, uh, philosophers who defend theism uh, do have a, a healthy dose of, of skepticism when they're using these arguments. They just tend to have some, some decent arguments. And, and, and here, here, here again, I have no problem with the argument from evil working. And if you look at Draper's version of the argument, Draper's version does not depend on, uh, on this assumption. Uh, his, his argument is sort of separate. It's separate. It doesn't depend on the assumption that we would have, we would be aware of God's reasons for doing things. In fact, let me, let me tell you very, very quickly how Draper responds to that, because that was pointed out to him that people, people tried to use skeptical theism against his argument. And he pointed out, Yes. So when I establish my probability or my expectation, how surprising is all this suffering on theism? You say it's possible that God has reasons that I am not aware of for doing for allowing all of this. He says, true, that's true. But it's also possible. Get your minds around this, because this is a good this is a good response to that. It's also possible that God has reasons not to allow suffering that I am not aware of. In other words, I have reasons that I'm aware of for God not to allow suffering. And I have reasons that I'm aware of for someone allowing suffering. And you're saying, you, you theist, you're, you're saying, well, it's possible that God has reasons to allow suffering that I'm not aware of. And Draper's response is, yeah, it's also possible that he has reasons for not allowing suffering that I'm not aware of. That if God existed, he would have all kinds of reasons for not allowing suffering. He would have access to all sorts of he would be aware of all sorts of states of affairs to not allow this. In which case, I'm basically saying, here's my level of expect, here's what I would expect from, from God. And you're saying, well, maybe it could go in this direction because of this. And I say, yeah, maybe it would go in the other direction too. So therefore it's kind of, it balances out and it's it's right where I would expect it. And so poss God's possible reasons don't affect my prob the, the probability of, of all this suffering we see around us. So anyway, those are some of my thoughts on that. Man, on that point, the last one that you just talked about with Draper, I, I disagree with that completely. I don't, I don't think that's a good response at all to skeptical I, theism. I, uh, you, we could we could actually talk about that really quick because I I see another problem. I see another problem with what he just said. Uh, what 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 do you think about it? So my my thoughts are that that doesn't actually reflect uh, accurately depict what skeptical theism is. So like if you look at something like what Michael Bergman has where he has these like three th skeptical theses as like the goods that we are aware of are not representative of all the goods that there are. That has nothing to do with what's possible or possible reasons that God has. So I think to me, it, it's like a, it's inaccurately depicting what skeptical theism actually is in order to sort of give an argument against it. It's never in my, in my view, it's never been about skeptical theism has never been the view that, Oh, it's possible that God has all of these reasons. That's never been the view. The view is that the, a particular inference that's made from I can't see any reasons to therefore it's likely that God has no reasons. Skeptical theism is really just a rejection of that kind of inference. It's not like it's possible that God has these morally justifying reasons. So that's that's one worry. And um, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and let you come in because I have other things to say, but we probably need to move on. Yeah, as far as, as, far as this, so the point here would be in that second premise if you say the probability for, as far as draper's argument the pro the claim that the probability of human you know the kinds and diversity and so on of human and animal suffering is much more probable on naturalism than on theism the relevance here would be well god may have reasons for allowing it and therefore 
you can't say that it's at that level of probability because it could be much more probable than you're aware of if God has these other reasons. And Draper, he, what's cool, he grants that. He says, yes, God could have all kinds of reasons for allowing all of this suffering that I'm not aware of. But if God did exist, it, it might be the case that he has reasons for allowing no suffering whatsoever. He would be aware of all kinds of additional bad states of affairs that arise out of suffering. And therefore, it doesn't affect my expectation as far as what is God is what God is going to produce. So that's his basic point. The problem with I see with, with what I see is that if you take if you take that entire response seriously, he's saying, you know, you know, if you could think of a dial here on, you know, the the probability of the evidence, if he says, okay, my dial right here is this is what this is how much suffering I would expect if God did exist. Maybe there's some suffering, but you know it should be towards bad people or something like that. Maybe I would expect something like that. Now you, you theist, you're saying, but maybe the human and animal suffering is much more probable because of you know things we're not aware of. And he says yes, but see, I don't think that's it's what also possible that it's less. Doing. No, 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 no. That, that that's what they that he his argument doesn't doesn't depend on an awareness assumption. So it's it's more of an adaptation of skeptical theism to address his point. They're saying that you are not, you're not accurate in your probability assessment. Um, you, you're not accurate. You can't be accurate with that. And he's saying, well, yeah, you could, God's reasons, but those God's reasons could go in, in either direction. So my, my response to that is then it's not that you end up with your original assessment say, okay, maybe God has reasons for, maybe God has more reasons against, it's not that that somehow balances you out. It's that you should be thinking, here are, the, here are the range of possibilities. I don't know. I don't know God's reasons. God could have all kinds of reasons for. God could have all kinds of reasons against. I don't know why you would somehow average that to your original uh, assumption there. It would just seem that, hey, anything that falls within there, I don't know. I don't know as far as this particular argument. So here's my expectation on naturalism and, and here's my expectation on theism. I don't know what to expect on theism because I'm not mm -hmm. aware of, of God's reasons. And so I think it's kind of that it's, it's, it's not that it's, it's not that it should have. Yeah. It's yeah. It's basically not, not sure about that. And I also, I also talk a little bit about that in my, in my dissertation. All right. Yeah. Let's move on. We can talk about that maybe privately, but with some, some of the mm -hmm. other responses to that. All right. So here's from Sol Sol Fredo. He's been on the channel a bunch. He's always saying in super chat. So thank you so much for that. He says, Based on your, well, he, he puts uh, your logic in square quotes. Based on your logic, would it be fair to say God's a, u a utilitarian? If not, how does your argument hold? If saying God allows evil versus Satan, how do you tell the difference and identify the sufficient reason? Um, I'm not aware of suggesting any reasons that God has. I, I've only put them forward as possibility because notice what, what we're doing now. We're not promoting... As far as what, I, as far as I'm concerned, we're not promoting theism when we're examining the argument from evil. We're saying, this is your argument. What does your argument prove? Mm -hmm. And so when we say, what does your argument prove? It's not, aha, here's my position. It's here are some holes in your argument. How would you defend against this? How would you defend this premise against this criticism? So when we talk about the free will defense, um, Again, like Plantinga, he he doesn't uh, he apparently doesn't believe that there are actually, uh, you know, demons, demonic, like manipulating demonic beings, yeah, pushing around tectonic plates. He's just saying, for your argument to succeed, that would have to not for this logical version of the argument to succeed, you'd have to know that that's not possible. How do you how mm -hmm. do you know that that's not possible? Doesn't mean he's defending that. It means, hey, here's a hole in your argument. You need to change your argument so that it doesn't have this problem. And then with the uh, with the you know, with the evidential version, with the inductive version, when people point out skeptical theism, it's your argument depends on an assumption, and that assumption is indefensible. You can't defend. It, it, I mean, you could believe it. You could believe that if God had reasons, you'd be aware of them. But a theist is under no obligation to agree with you. No one is under any obligation to believe you until you actually defend the premise, and then you look at prominent defenders of the argument from evil. Paul Draper, William Rowe, they say, yep, that's a problem. That argument fails. And then the, you know, at the popular atheist level, they're saying that argument doesn't fail. That argument is how could you defend the claim that God has these reasons? I'm not defending it. I'm saying your argument depends on you defending that assumption. 
how would you possibly defend that assumption? Because it, it's indefensible. It's, it's obvious if God existed, God would be aware of all kinds of things that we are not aware of. And it could be things like free will. It could be his concern could be soul building. It could be a, you know, religious responses and, obje- you know, it could be a religious thing where we're in, you know, we're fallen creatures and the world is, in, it could be all kinds of things. And it, it can be thing that, it can be the idea that God is aware of all these kinds of connections and so on that we just can't com- comprehend because they're too complex. Could be all kinds of things, but this is your argument. Your argument, ha- you have to show that your argument avoids these problems that we're pointing out. And what we see over and over again is that it's it's the the it's the defenders of the argument from evil who are acknowledging, yeah, that's a problem for us. That's a problem. So let's go back and reformulate our argument. And we'll come back and try to give something stronger. And there's not, that's how, that's how philosophy works. All right. Uh, here's another question from Russell Jones. He sent in a hundred dollar super chat. Thank you so much, Russ. He's actually a, a big supporter of the channel as well. So, uh, thanks for popping on and sending in this question, Russell. He says, is it possible? Uh, no, here's a quote. It is possible, this is the quote, it is possible that this suffering isn't necessary, end quote, seems incompatible with moderate modal skepticism, MMS, endorsed by atheist philosophers like Felipe Leon and theists like Van and Wagon. Does this seem accurate? How could an MMS atheist endorse Rowe's argument? Moderate modal skepticism. Um... No, I'm thinking about the first claim that that it would somehow be inconsistent with uh, uh-huh. moderate modal skepticism. It is possible the suffering say, isn't necessary. I don't see why a moderate modal skeptic would reject that. It's possible. Well, a, a modal skeptic is going to be skeptic skeptical of possibility claims. So um, it is possible the suffering isn't necessary. The, both of those are, you know, it's possible this isn't necessary. Those are both modal claims and so like if a moderate modal skeptic or if a modal skeptic someone who's skeptical about our ability to pontificate about possibility and necessity if someone is yeah, skeptical that, about that's not it's that. not that's not yeah but that's not saying that you can't so so, so someone 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 like van inwagen how, how he uses this is when you say well why didn't god do make the universe like this he, wh- why didn't God do it like this? So Van Inwagen's response is, well, look, you ha- you would have to really show me what that universe would be like. You'd have to flesh out the natural laws of the universe and show me that this would actually work out. So he's he's skeptical in, in that sense. He's skeptical in, in that sense of just because you can say it's possible doesn't make it actually possible. And so we need to be uh, skeptical. As far as just, just saying... I don't know, you know, I mean, this is, this is possible for all I know. You have, you have different kinds of, you have different kinds of, you have different kinds of possibilities, right? Like you can have, you can have logical possibility and impossibility. And then you can have metaphysical possibility and impossibility. And then you can have nomological possibility and impossibility as far as, you know, the possibility given the laws of, of nature. nature. And I, th- I, th- I think you can be a, a skeptic in, in one sense, I think you could be skeptics of, you know, these modalities in one sense. But as far as saying, well, that's possible, uh, be weird to say you don't believe in, in saying that's po- you can say that's possible for all I know without saying that it's. And I think that's what's going on in a lot of these claims, and I don't think it always gets distinguished, but you can say possible for all I know without saying it's metaphysically possible or it's logically possible. You can say, hey, I, I'm actually skeptical about my ability to say what is really ultimately metaphysically possible. But I think what's going on in a lot of these cases, you're saying possible for all I know. And I don't think any, I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with saying this is possible for, for all I know. So in, in other words, you can say, hey, such and such is possible for all I know but I'm not saying that it's actually metaphysically possible or something like this, or mm-hmm. that this is necessary or that this is impossible. Uh, I don't know that. All I know is possible, uh, possible as far as, as far as I know, as far as my knowledge yeah. goes. This is getting some, uh, we're, we're getting in some, some, some real deep philosophical waters here. All right. Here's a question from Joshua Anderson. And this one is a little bit off topic, but it's still uh, interesting to think about. And I think we should, we should raise it and get your thoughts on it. He says, I'm a fan of both of your works. Thoughts on this. Jesus is not the son of God because he believed in the Old Testament, which has been proven by scientists and archaeologists to be mythological. 
So it's an argument against the divinity of Jesus. Um, or or just the messiahship of Jesus. Um yeah, I wouldn't find that argument very persuasive. Um Yeah, my because, initial thought is just that like Jesus if he if he were God or if he, you know, was who he said he was, then he would only believe true things about the Old Testament. Mhm. Yeah, it's basically if Jesus made the claims that he made about himself and he rose from the dead, then he he was who he claimed to be. Even mm-hmm. if, you know, let, let, let me let me let me put it this way: in order to in order to say Jesus believed this, you're 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 assuming you have a good idea of what Jesus said and did. And so if you have a good idea of what Jesus said and, and did, then you'd have to think, well, I have a good idea of the claims he made about himself, and um, you're still stuck with the evidence for the resurrection. And so you'd be stuck with, you'd be, if you think we have accurate knowledge about Jesus, then, I mean, some of the best knowledge we have about Jesus would be things like he died on the cross, his followers um, came to believe that he had risen from the dead and appeared to them. He believed that he was somehow, you know, ushering in the king of the kingdom of God. Uh, he believed that he's the Messiah. And so those are the, the sort of strongest claims that we have about Jesus in terms of if we're if we want to say, here's what we know about the historical Jesus. Um, his particular his particular beliefs, those wouldn't be at the top of the list on the things that we have the most evidence for knowing what what he believed. Um, so. The point, the, the only point here is if you're saying, hey, we have accurate information about all these claims and Jesus' beliefs and so on, then obviously you know these other things about him because you have much better evidence that, he, that we knew these other things. And so if you were really convinced that he was wrong about the Old Testament, and that, that case would be on you, that Jesus believed this certain thing that he was wrong about, um, then you'd have, to, you'd have to say, well, therefore his... Therefore, what that he he didn't rise from the dead? I don't know. I, I have better evidence for that than I have for the things that Jesus said. So you'd have to prove a couple of things along along those lines. But as a general rule, you'd, you usually don't want to throw out your strongest evidence for for something else. If you if you take Jesus' claims about the Old Testament seriously, then you have much more evidence for other things that he said and did and believed, and therefore you have good evidence that that who he was is true and so you might want to might want to rethink your position about uh about the argument against him all right here's one more question that will close this live stream out is assuming that humans whoops it pulled up the wrong one here that's interesting all right here we go let's see if this works there we go uh super chat from backwards man thank you for the super chat he says is assuming that humans can't determine if gratuitous suffering exists with an omniscient, om- omnibenevolent God, an appeal to mystery, or is it begging the question? So it's a, it's an oddly phrased. Let me read it one more time. Mm-hmm. Is assuming that humans can't determine if gratuitous suffering exists with an omniscient, omnibenevolent God, is it an appeal to? Is that an appeal to mystery or begging the question? I, I would regard it. I would regard it as stating a fact, right? And and here the. The argument is not that you should run around, run around in a state of confusion about what's going on. Skeptical theism is that's just based on a fact. And the point is that this fact about the extent of our knowledge is a problem for arguments that depend on that that claim not being true. That the, the statement, if God exists, then he would be aware of all kinds of things that I'm not aware of, and he would be able to comprehend vastly more complex states of affairs than I'm capable of, that he would have all kinds of reasons for doing things that I'm not aware of. That's just indisputably true from the definition of theism and from my understanding of of what I am. And so if you come along with an argument from evil that just assumes, assumes as obviously true that if God had reasons for something, I would have access to them and I would be aware of them so that if I can't think of a reason for God to do something, then, well, there, there probably, there probably is no such reason. That's just that is a flaw in the argument. And the only, the only point there is, 
don't make your argument with that assumption. Don't have that assumption built into your argument. Build, construct your argument so that it avoids that and it goes just based on things that we know about and things that we are aware of. Do not do not have as any part of your argument the assumption that we would be aware of, of God's reasons. And so it's how do you formulate it without that? So this isn't just, uh, you know, I don't see how it would be begging the question at all, because this, is, this isn't this is this isn't uh, us defending a theistic view by assuming it. This is not defending anything. This is all we're doing here is just saying, hey, when we think of everything that could be known, we know a a very, 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 very small fraction of it. And so you have to formulate your argument based on that understanding and any argument you have to. Yeah, y- you can't you can't be violating that that awareness of our own selves and our own limitations. Yeah. So there was a, there was a couple of things that we did while we were talking that I think respond to this as well is that we, we, we talk about two different things in particular that can motivate skeptical theism. One of those motivations is what, what David mentioned earlier, is that basically when we think about how much knowledge God has, like or all the knowledge that there is, not just like a circle like this, our knowledge in comparison is going to be like a dot. It's going to be like a tiny pin, mm-hmm. pinpoint. And that is just obviously true. God is omniscient. We are not. There's there's no denying that at all. And there's no denying that our knowledge compared to all the knowledge there is possible is just tiny. Like that's just an obvious fact. So it's so that's one way to motivate it. Another way to motivate it is is uh, what I mentioned about complexity. So some of these goods that would justify some of these really horrible things like the Holocaust, those goods would have to be so complex that it wouldn't be surprising if they were so complex like how all of the intricate, you know, everything is interconnected and all the different people's lives affect each other. It wouldn't be surprising that a good, or if there was like some ultimate reason why the Holocaust happened, it wouldn't be surprising if that reason was so complex that it's just beyond our cognitive uh, ability to comprehend or understand. So those are two different ways that you can motivate skeptical theism. So it doesn't amount to to question begging. I think it really is, uh, is, is a humble position. When you think about it, it just seems sort of obvious. So it doesn't have to amount to to question begging or or anything like that. So is there anything that you'd like to uh, leave the audience with, David, on, on this subject? I know that you're thinking about doing some more work on it. So what what, what do you have in mind? Yeah, just uh, I mean, since we we did talk a little bit about uh, about Jesus there at the end, and and I was just thinking about that while you're talking about something like the the Holocaust or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, and then thinking back about my son and me saying, you know, he's 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 getting these shots while I hold him down. This guy stabs him in the leg and he's not aware of why I'm doing it. Um, and his his mind at that point is not even capable of understanding why that is in a way that, you know, if God has reasons for allowing the Holocaust, we may not be aware of why that is. But uh, m- my thoughts were, you know, if I could get any message across to my son in that situation, he obviously isn't capable of understanding any, you know, it, sophisticated reasons or something like that. But if I could get any message across, it would be, you know, son, you know, I love you. So there's a reason you know it. And I think you have something like that in Christianity. If Jesus rose from the dead. Then you kind of have something like that. It's kind of like, guys, anything that confuses you, you can you can trust me on that. I just took the worst thing that could possibly happen, God dying at the hands of sinful human beings, uh, and I actually showed that it's the greatest thing that could ever happen. And so, um, you know, usually in philosophy, they sort of isolate the the concept of God from more specific religious traditions. So they call this the God of the philosophers. And then if you get more specific, that's called expanded theism. It's, it's theism plus. It's theism plus all these additional things. But, uh, you know, if people are still thinking, you know, what about Christianity and what about, uh, you know, does 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 this teaching of Christianity actually help with this thing? Then with all those kinds of things, as far as, hey, if we don't get it, well, guess what? If if Christianity is true, if Jesus was who he claimed to be and rose from the dead, you kind of have exactly what I would want if, you know, I was in that situation with my son, hey, maybe if he can't understand everything, I at least hope he would understand there's a reason for things and that, uh, you know, that he shouldn't, he shouldn't think that I don't love him because of this. So, um, yeah, if Jesus, basically if Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus died on the cross for sins, if, if Christianity is true, 
even if you don't understand something, even if you don't get something, it should at least be in your mind. Yeah, but, you know, I know even if I don't understand this or even if this goes beyond my comprehension, uh, I know that the creator of the universe nevertheless uh, loves us and that there's a reason for everything. Yeah, that, that's really good. All right. Well, David, thanks for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. It's uh, I know it's kind of unusual for you to talk about the subject that you spent several years studying in, in, in depth, but it's uh, I'm sure that you enjoyed it. We had a we had a lot of good conversations about it, and uh, thank you guys for sending your questions for your super chats. It's been awesome. Um, yeah, I think that that pretty much does it. So, thanks, David, for coming on. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right, so I'm going to talk to the audience directly for just a second. If you watch my live streams and and you pay attention to stuff, usually at the end of my videos is when I do announcements and talk about other things that we have going on. So I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take an opportunity to talk about those things. So one of the things that's interesting is that on Saturday, two days from now, I'm going to have my brother on the the channel. He, he's going to come to my house. He's going to be sitting here right next to me. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to be answering your questions. So my brother, if you know any of the story about behind the reasons why I'm an apologist and why I do these things now is because about eight years ago at this point, my brother became an atheist and he's still an atheist. So he's going to be here uh, with me, we're gonna. This is the first time we're doing anything like this, so it's gonna be just straight Q and A. We're just gonna be sitting here. He, he's probably gonna tell some of his story, but then it's just gonna be Q and A. We're just gonna hang out, and have a good time. And so, if uh, if you wanna support the channel, check that out. Come come check it out. It's gonna be on uh, two days from now. So I think that's July. I don't what what is today. Today is July twenty third, twenty twenty. So it'll be on July twenty fifth, two days from now. Another thing is that we're currently in the middle of producing twelve apologetics courses for beginners. And uh, here's here's a list if you want to see the list of the different courses that we have. Now, as of yesterday, we have officially recorded five of the 12 episodes or courses. And tonight we're recording our sixth episode with Luke Barnes on the fine tuning argument. So what we've recorded so far is logic, argumentation and probability with Tim McGrew. How can we know God exists with Tyler McNabb? The contingency argument with Josh Rasmussen. The uh, the argument for the resurrection with Mike Lacona and the problem of evil, which is interesting because it's we were talking about the problem of evil all throughout today's show. So we did a beginner's episode on the problem of evil with a PhD student, Justin Mooney. We recorded that yesterday. It's actually available right now on Patreon. So if this was a little bit over your head or you wanted to get kind of an introduction to the problem of evil, the various responses to it. This course with Justin Mooney is going to be such an important and amazing resource for you. So the way to access these 12 courses and to support the ministry, patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. If you just click the little arrow down below, you can actually just click the link over to our Patreon and support us there. So if you support the ministry at $10 a month, you get access to these courses, to all 12 of the courses. That's just $10 a month. And that's going to help make sure that we continue to do what we're doing. We're in the process of uh, doing our first conference in the uh, fall of 2021, CCV1. We've already got our lineup and everything. We're just uh, waiting to hear back from a couple people on venue. So we're raising funds right now to be able to do conferences and some other really cool things. So anyways, if you appreciate the content we've been producing, you want to gain access to these 12 videos and other stuff that we have going on over at our Patreon, patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. And uh, thank you in advance if you're considering doing this. It, it really means a lot to me personally that you would want to support me and my family in this ministry. So thank you. And until next time, we will see you guys later. Remember, Christianity is true. <laughs>